All right, all right. Welcome to the next latest and greatest webinar on C949 Data Structures and Algorithms 1 here at WGU. I am Professor Lusby, and I wanted to create uh, another webinar picking up where we last left off. And I believe up to this point, uh, I, I was able to cover uh, units one, well, one and most of unit two. And uh, I'm super excited because now we're getting into the labs at the end of unit two, and we're gonna see how we can apply what we've learned here concerning Python uh, to some real, uh, real examples, okay? So hopefully we can cover uh, these labs here. Um, and so, yeah, let's just dive right in here. Uh, if we take a look at the first one, uh, 2.13, we're gonna see that, <clears throat> This lab is called Divide Input Integers. It basically wants us to, well, write a program that reads uh, two integers, one called user num, one called div num. Uh, div num, I assume, means the divisor, terrible name, as input and output, user num divided by div num, aka divisor, three times using floor divisions. All right, we did cover floor divisions. Uh, in some of the previous uh, webinars. And so, all right. So for example, and I, I do like that they give us, if the input is this, then the output is this, right? That's the whole IPO paradigm that I've been talking about. Uh, it's the whole point of a computer. We take input, we produce output. So if the input is 2000, well, in theory, our program should stick it here into user num, this 2000 value in the user num. And then if the second value is two, it should take that uh, value two and put it into this div num guy, all right? And if we do that and our program works correctly, we should see the output is 1,500,250. Now the question is why? Well, uh, if, we, if we look at the second part here, outputs user num divided by div num three times. So if we take 2,000 divided by two, well, the first time it is 1,000, but notice that we're gonna update user num with the value 1000. We take 1000 divided by two, right, three times, we get 500, that's the second time. And if we take 500 divided by two, third time, we get 250. So our program should take whatever this first number is divided by two, take the result of that divided by two, take the result of that divided by two using the floor division, which basically means we use slash slash instead of slash. Um, all right, so how do we go about doing this? Uh, this is definitely one possible solution, right? There's always <clears throat> way more possible solutions, but I wanna make sure that if, at least if w this solution is presented, you're able to read it, interpret it, um, step through it with the debugger, okay? Uh, and make sure that it, it behaves appropriately. All right, because on the OA, yeah, you might see some code. They're not gonna ask you to write code from scratch, but they are gonna ask you to possibly read and interpret code. And so that's why I always like to go over these labs is because I wanna show you one solution. Let's make sure that solution makes sense. And at the end of the day, if you have another solution, well, that's fine. As long as your input is this and your output is this, well, guess what? You found another possible solution. Now, the one downside that I have noticed concerning these labs here, at least for this particular course, is there's no real debugger. So you're able to put in what you think is your Python solution, and you're able to um, basically run the program, um, but uh, there's no debugger. At the end of the day, there's no debugger here. I have no way of stepping through this code. Uh, it's just a bunch of trial and error. And let me tell you, in industry, they are going to expect you to know how to use a debugger. You don't, you don't want to just do trial and error. So what I'll say is this, that uh, for this, this course, or this part of the course concerning Python, I would strongly recommend you installing a Python IDE. Uh, one of my favorites is called PyCharm. It's developed by JetBrains. It is free if you download the Community Edition. And uh, it basically looks something like this. Well, all right, fine, this, all right? And um, 
that's what I'm going to use to. Uh, I want to I want to demonstrate how to use a Python IDE with this code because it's very important that we get insight into how these programs are being run and what in the heck they're doing. Because if you just keep this trial and error stuff going, which is what you have to do here because there is no debugger. Um, and at least with C173, there is a debugger involved with the labs. That's not here. So here's what I'm gonna say. Um, what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna open up this window. Oh no, will it not let me? I'm gonna put this one here. I'm going to put this one. Uh, I want to do it automatically for me. Here we go. Put, ah, there we are, finally. Put this one here. And then this one is here. All right. So what I've got here is, is PyCharm Community Edition. It is free. It is open. Um, I have created a bunch of new Python files, one for uh, each one of these labs and so right now we are interested in 213 and um, all right so this is one possible solution now let's examine this solution let's run it let's step through it and let's make sure we understand why this solution if if this is the input we will get this output so let's take a let's kind of do what's called dust checking Let, let's take a look at this code here and see if it makes sense with the requirements right next to us all right so first things first obviously we always create programs uh, they're a se sequential set of commands right and, and it starts at the top and you work your way uh, the computer goes line by line right works its way to the bottom there's nothing magical about this it's literally just a list of commands and that is what the computer is going to run. Now, the question is, well, we, we, we look at line three here. Uh, and let's take a step back. Remember, I was talking about the IPO paradigm, right? Input, process, output. For sure, this is the I part. We are getting the input. And uh, the very first piece of input that the requirements tell us we need is this user num. So that's why on line three, we see, well, there's a variable here called user num. And we're going to use the input. Remember from, from previous uh, webinars that this input command is a Python function that will basically allow the user to type in a value, hit enter. Uh, the caveat to that is input will always, always, always return a string. All right. And this is what trips up a lot of uh, students who are new to programming. If we were not to wrap this input guy inside of this int or integer cast, then user num is just a string and we can't do any math with it. Same with line four here, div num. Well, that's fine. We use input to get the second value that the requirements tell us we need, but we also need to cast it to an integer before we use it because input returns a string. All right. So just always keep that in mind. Yeah, this input is, is a a great function that we can use to obtain input from the user, but it will always come back as a string and you need to cast it to the appropriate data type um, before we can use it, at least in a math formula. If it's literally a string that we're interested in, well, then we don't need to do any casting and, and we're good with, with that. Okay, so next is, so this is for sure the input. Input, here's the process. Right. Um, let's calculate those output values. Well, what in the heck is the the output value? Well, over here it tells us user num divided by div num three times. So let's 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 focus on the first time. Right. How do we calculate user num divided by div num using the floor division? Fair enough. That's line eight here. And remember that anything with the pound in front of it is a comment. The computer is going to ignore. This is just for the humans. All right. Which is important, too. <laughs> All right. Uh, line eight here says, well, take user num equal user num slash slash div num. All right. What in the heck's going on here? For sure, for sure, this is an assignment operator. Okay. The computer will always evaluate what's to the right of the assignment operator first, 
figure out what its value is. Well, user num, if we type in 2,000, that's going to be 2,000 divided by 2. Well, 2,000 divided by 2 is 1,000. It's going to take that return value and assign it, hence the name assignment operator, assign 1,000 to this user num uh, variable. And we'll step through this using the debugger here uh, in a second. I'm going to demonstrate that. Um, all right, so user num is equal to 1,000. And then line 9 says, all right, we'll go ahead and print user num to the screen. Notice this n equals with a blank space. What in the heck is that about? So for sure we want to print out the result user num. That should make sense to everybody, which is 1,000. But why do we have this n guy? This n guy, okay, if you don't put this, if you delete this, then every one of these print statements is going to be on their own line. And instead of the output being 1,500,250 1, separated by spaces, what you're going to see is 1,000, and then under it is 500, and then under it is 250. Okay, who the heck cares? It's the same, same stuff two different ways. Well, when we run these automated tests on our code, and we'll do that in a second once we're comfortable that this is a good solution, uh, these automated tests expect very specific output, and if you put each one of these on its own line, the automated test is going to freak out and go, uh, no, it's not, uh, you don't pass. If they're literally telling us the output all needs to be on the same line, only separated by spaces, well, guess what? We need to use this end delimiter uh, in order to, because the default delimiter is push it to the next line. If we don't if we don't want that, then we need to say, well, hey, use the space delimiter instead. That's that's what that's what this is talking about. So we're going to print user num and then a space after it. That's what we see here, 1,000 space after it. And then we go to line 11, and in theory, that should be 1,000 divided by 2, floor operator, meaning chop off any of the decimal value. But we're okay because it's a round number. 1,000 divided by 2 is 500, so the floor or even the regular division operator is going to give us the same answer. It's going to give us 500. We take the 500, put it in the user num. Guess what? We print it out using a space delimiter. That's why we see 500 space here. And then line 14 says, okay, do it one more time. Let's take 500 divided by 250. Take that, right? Whatever that, uh, 250, 500 divided by 2, excuse me. 500 divided by 2 is 2, 250. We assign that to user num, and then we print uh, that out. Notice we don't need the end guy here because it's the end of the end of the line. All right, so this high level looks good. Now, what I like to do and what you should do in industry is don't trust your eyes. <laughs> okay, we need to make sure that this code is doing what it's supposed to do, and uh, every IDE. Uh, has a debugger and you have an ability to what's called set a breakpoint and that's what I just did here at least in PyCharm if you click next to the number in this gray space right you can add as many breakpoints as you want and basically what that means is when the computer runs this code it's going to stop on that line and let us step through each line individually and while you're like oh my god it's going to take forever why would I do that well let me tell you uh Imagine a much more complex program with many more lines of code. Uh, you need to be comfortable with the debugger, especially when you go to work for industry. So please take the time to get to know a good Python IDE, uh, learn how to set a breakpoint. And after we set the breakpoint, what we can do is we can say, you know what, debug this code. And we should see it run down here and look, it, it hasn't hit the it hasn't hit the breakpoint yet, and the reason is that it started executing the code. It got to line three, and notice line three is waiting on input from the user. Let's put in what the book uh, gave us here. Let's say two thousand. Okay. And now, well, what in the heck's going on now? It still hasn't hit the breakpoint. Well, if we look at line four, right? It's going to go from line three to line four. It's asking us to input the 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 div num. And as a good example, let's put in the number two. Okay. Now, once I hit enter here, I would expect it to hit the breakpoint on line eight. Let's see what happens here. So I'm going to type in a number and hit enter. Oh, finally. 
All right, good. So it hit our breakpoint on line eight, and look, look at how cool this is. It literally shows us in memory this variable called user num is set to 2000. Well, sure enough, and even down here in the variables window shows us we have a variable called user num in memory set to 2000. We have a variable called div num set to two, and that's exactly what we typed in. So up to this point, everything makes sense. I'm happy. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, and we're on line eight. So now the question is, well, what in the heck's going to happen with line eight here, right? Well, uh, it should run whatever's on the right-hand side here, take that result and put it into the left-hand side. So if we look at the right-hand side, we'll see user num is equal to 2,000 divided by floor, floor division, by 2. Well, 2,000 divided by 2 with floor division is 1,000.0. Uh, and because it's floor, we're going to get rid of the 0. .0. So this is equal to 1,000. And in theory, it should take, oh, look at that. It even tells us that. And when I hit step over here, it should take this 1,000, this whole 1,000 value, and assign it to user num. So when I click on step over here in the memory, I would expect to see user num go from 2,000 to 1,000. That's going to tell me line 8 is working properly. So here, and these are the little, every IDE, every debugger has this. You've got to step over, you've got to step in two, you got to, yeah, these are the two important. Let's just stick on these. And right now, because we don't have any functions, we're going to talk about functions later. Step into will come in really handy later on when we need to step into custom functions that we create. Right now, we're not there. So the only thing we're really going to be using is step over. All right. So we're going to step over. And what I expect to see is user num updated to 1,000. When I click step over here and it goes to line 9, sure enough, user num is equal to 1,000. I know that line 8 did its thing and there's no bug here all right so now we get to line nine print user num well we know user num's a thousand with the end space delimiter so when i hit step over here i would expect to see 1000 output to the to the console to the screen so let me hit step over here and notice that here's where things are a little weird especially for a lot of students and even me sometimes this is the debugger. This is the console screen. <laughs> so this print guy prints to the console. You have to click on the console to see what's going on. But the debugger shows us under the hood what's going on. So sometimes you do have to alternate right, between the debugger and the console. And every ID is a little bit different there. Some even put the console kind of off to the side. Um, but with, but with this one, in order to see what's going on, you got to click on console. All right, so it does look like line 9 did print out the value 1,000. Uh, so that looks good. Line 11 says, all right, we'll take user num, which is now 1,000, not 2,000, right, because we reassigned it up here. 1,000 divided by 2, well, that should be, what is it, 500, right? Take 500 and put that into user num. So when I step over line 11 here, I would expect user num to go from 1,000 to 500 because of this part. So let's do that. I'm going to hit step over. And sure enough, user num is 500. And now we're going to print it using line 12. I hit step over here. I would expect to see 500 in the console. Let's go to the console. Sure enough, there's 500. So that looks good. And now line 14 says, all right, well, let's do it another time. We'll well, here, user num is 500, right? 500 divided by 2 is 250. We take 250, put in a user num. So when I click step over here, I would expect user num to update from 500 to 250. Step over, sure enough, user num uh, changes from 500 to 250. And then on line 15, we're going to print that out to the console. So we should see 250 being printed out to the console. So I'm going to hit step over here. And we see 250 being printed out to the console. All right. So at this point, I've walked through the code. I've put in the good input. I've received what is expected for output. And I'm pretty darn confident that we've got a, a good solution here. So I'm going to come back over here to our handy dandy Zybooks learning resource. 
and I'm going to go ahead and paste my solution here and I am going to say submit for grading and let's see what we get and well I wish there was a way to scroll over anyways submissions fine yep passed 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 notice that it is using three different sets of input right we started out with the 2000 and the two which is what we just stepped through but then it did well instead of 2002 let's let's run your program with 104 as the input still looks good and then it ran 8000 and negative 2 as our input and even that looked good all right so that's kind of the way you want to approach these these labs all right is that you know look at what it wants you to do maybe take some of the starter code that's presented to you and i say you know put it here inside of of, of a, a python ide like pycharm and play with it here once you've played with it here and you've stepped through it and everything looks good here then copy paste submit mode submit for grading um, because otherwise it's just a guessing game if you're not stepping through the code uh, and, and I see this frustration with a lot of my students. They, they don't want to take the time to learn a debugger and step through the code. And I say, good luck. I mean, you can do it that way. But in industry, uh, they're going to expect you to be to know how to use the debugger because you can be much more efficient with your time than just guessing. Okay, I promise you that. Uh, but yeah, there is a little bit of a learning curve to using the debugger. So let's take a look at uh, 2.14, and it's well worth your time. Trust me. All right, let's take a look at 2.14, uh, driving costs. So basically it says driving is expensive, especially now. Write a program with a gas, uh, car's gas mileage. All right, and the cost of gas, this floating put input, and the output of the gas cost for 20 miles, 75 miles, and 500 miles. All right, so we have the car's gas mileage, and we have the cost of gas. And then we're basically going to put in, well, how far do we want to drive and how much that's going to cost us? So, for example, if the input is 20, right, we want to drive 20 miles. Cost of gas is a floating. And each gallon of gas costs us $3.15. Well, then um, the output should be, well, for 20 miles, it yeah, it basically costs you three dollars and sixteen cents because it's it's one mot, it's one gallon of gas to get you twenty miles, right? But if you want to go seventy five miles, well, seventy five miles, that's almost what, triple. And so yeah, to go seventy five miles, it's going to cost you eleven dollars and eighty five cents. And if you want to go five hundred miles, well, that's going to cost you seventy nine dollars. Okay. Right, so the first step to these labs is I want you to really make sure that you understand what the input is, you understand what the output is, and why. Because if you don't understand that, now it's a guessing game on top of a guessing game. <laughs> All right, so make sure that in your head um, that you you understand well this information relates to this because that's 20 miles, this information relates to this because that's 75 miles. This information relates to this because that's 500 miles. Now, here is one potential solution. Is it the only solution? No. But in theory, this solution, if we put in these values and we worry about 20 miles, 75 miles, and 500 miles, we should get this output. And you'll see, lo and behold, this is the IPO paradigm. All right. Oops. Sometimes I get my languages mixed up. <sighs> All right. So I just put some comments in there to help us out with this IPO uh, paradigm. And yeah, let's just go top to bottom. Let's make sure that let's desk check this, make sure that this makes sense here. And then we're going to step through it. All right. So line two is the first line, right? It ignores the comment. And it says, we'll have the user go ahead and type in a value, 
which is what this input uh, function will do. Take whatever the, the user types in after they hit enter, return as a string. But because this return is a string, we need to cast it to a float here, right? Because miles per gallon, and if we look over here, includes the decimal point. So this is not an integer. For sure, this is at least a float. And so we cast this to a float, and then we take that value and we assign it to miles per gallon. Same with line three. Well, then we the computer should go to line three. Allow the user to type in another value. And honestly, what we should do here is be a little more user friendly. Type in the miles per gallon. Right. Type in the uh, cost of gas. Cost of gas. Uh, gas. Gas per gallon. Spelling is key. <laughs> All right. Um, so then we ask the user, well, type in the cost of gas. We're going to cast that to a float right, because that's a string, cast that to a float, and then we're going to assign it to dollars per gallon. And then the computer's going to jump down to line six and say, okay, well, fine. Um, take whatever this miles per gallon is, uh, make it a percentage, uh, multiply that times 20, because that's the number of miles that we want to go. And look, there is a lot of math involved here, right? Um, and there are applications that don't involve a lot of math, and there's other very precise, mission-critical, scientific applications that do involve a lot of math. And um, again, you're not going to have to come up with these formulas on your own from scratch on the OA. I just want to make sure that you can read this code and, and, it, and you're comfortable with reading it and interpreting its behavior, okay? So at the end of the day, this formula here will take our miles per gallon, multiply it by 20, and then multiply it by how much each gallon of gas costs. And at that point, we're going to take that number, whatever that is, and assign it to this new variable here called dollars 20 miles. Um, even this is a terrible variable name. Maybe call it dollar uh, 20 mile cost or something, right? Um, at least it's, they're, in the, they're going in the right direction. They've got some nice long descriptive names. They're just a little off. And I would bring that up at a code review, by the way, in, in industry. Um, and then the next line, line seven says, all right, well, fine. Do the exact same formula that you did up here, but use 75 instead. Why? Because that's what the requirements are telling us to do over here is use 75 miles. Same with 500. Why? Well, requirements want us to calculate how much is going to be for 500 miles? So this process part of the algorithm is calculating how much is it going to cost for 20 miles, for 75 miles, for 500 miles, and we're going to store it in three different variables. Boom, boom, boom. Notice we haven't printed anything out yet. That is what line uh, 11 is about. This is our output part of the IPO paradigm. Once we have those three values, well, now let's use the print function so that we can print these values out to the, the output window or the console. But uh, let's get fancy. <laughs> let's use what's called the formatter or the F guy. Um, and this formatter, and I believe we talked about this in previous webinars, what it basically says is, well, hey, take whatever this value, that this variable value is, and format it as a float with two decimal points when you show it, right? So if it's 0, 0.0, you're going to see 0, 0. If it's 0, 0.1, you're going to see 0, 0.10, all right? Same here with the, do the dollar 75 miles. Well, that's fine, but make sure you show at least two decimal points as a float. Uh, well, only, I shouldn't say at least, show only two decimal points, show only two decimal points, same here for the dollars 500 miles show only two decimal points now in my head though i'm trying to think here um i'm looking at the output and i see these spaces you see these spaces in between and, and the test is going to expect these spaces and so i'm looking over here going well does it include the space yeah sure enough right here in between these format specifiers 
in between the curly brackets, there is a space. If we were to delete this space, it would still run, but it was going to make all these numbers run together, and you're going to fail the test. So notice how even white space matters, right? Every single character matters. So now what I want to do is, okay, I desk checked it. I'm looking at the code. I'm looking at the input output. Everything makes sense to me. Let me set a breakpoint. Let's step through it, and let's make sure that under the hood, it's doing everything that I expect. So I'm going to debug this, right, using PyCharm here. And yeah, type in the miles per gallon. Well, let's use this example over here. Let's put in 20. All right, find 20 miles per gallon. Type in the gos, uh, gos, cost per gallon. It is $3.15. And Ninety nine, whatever. Okay, I don't know why they always do that. I guess to make it look cheap. Um, so there's the cost. So when I hit enter here, I would expect this breakpoint to hit on line six. If not, something weird's going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter here. Sure enough, we're on line six. And the way we know is that when it turns dark blue like this, and every IDE is a little bit different. Some some use like a, a yellow arrow. Pie charm kind of highlights it in blue, um, but there should be an indicator to say, oh, breakpoint's hit, I'm here. So on line six, if we look at this, we see miles per gallon is 20. Well, sure enough, that's what we typed in. Dollars per gallon is 3.1599. Sure enough, that's what we typed in. And I guess to be on the safe side in industry, what I would do is I would punch this into a calculator. 20 times 1.0 divided by 20.0 times 3.1599. And whatever value your calculator comes up with, when I hit step over, I would expect to see that value assigned to dollar, dollars 20 miles. And we know it's 3.16 because they give us the good output here. So when I hit step over here, I would expect dollars 20 miles to be set to 3.16, all right? And let's see if that happens. I'm gonna step over here. We look at dollars, 20 miles. Eh. Yeah, 3.1599, fine. Uh, the reason why you see 3.16 here is because of this format specifier, and we'll talk about that uh, here in a second. So now, we got a line seven, fine, right? Same miles per gallon value, same dollars per gallon va value. The only difference is we're multiplying it by 75 this time. Why? Because it's here in the requirements. And if we do that, well, we should come up with a value close to 11.85. So when I step over line seven here, I would expect this, this variable to be set to 11.85. Let's see if that is the case. Dollar 75 miles, 11.84, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that is 11.85, so I know that line 7 is good. Now, we're on line 8, same formula, same miles per gallon, dollars per gallon values, times 500 this time. Well, when we do this, it should come out to 79.0. And if you don't trust this, you can plug it into a calculator, right? At the end of the day, never be afraid to, to bust out the calculator to verify a formula. All right. Uh, and so when I hit step over here, I would expect to see this variable, dollars, 500 miles, equal to around 79.0. So I'm going to hit step over here. Where is it? 500. Yeah, 78.99. So sure enough, if we do two decimals, that's going to round up to 79.0. And then it, it jumps to the next line, which is 11. And, and here on line 11, we're going to print to the console. Whatever value is in dollar, dollars 20 miles, whatever value is in dollars 75 miles, whatever value is in dollars 500 miles, with two decimal places. Two decimal places. So when I step over here in the console window, and notice nothing's here yet, I would expect to see these three values immediately printed here. When I hit step over here, let's see. Bada boom, bada bing. Here is those three values, um, and this matches this. Now, what's going to be interesting is notice how it 
all of a sudden ran all of this stuff together on the one line. It, I'm I'm curious if I submit this code here, right? And I say submit mode, and I say submit for grading. I'm I'm gonna say the automated test is gonna freak out because all of a sudden all these prompts are running together, and maybe that's why they didn't put these prompts up here. Let's hit submit for grading. We'll see what happens. Yep, there it is. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> so, see, it was only expecting this. And because I tried to make it user friendly, now it's freaking out saying nothing passed. So, notice how picky these automated tests are. If you put in this out input, this should be the only output. And I made the mistake of. Huh, trying to make it user friendly. My bad. <laughs> oh gosh. In industry, this is a terrible automated unit test. <laughs> we won't talk about that. So if I get rid of the prompts, we come back over here, and then we run it. God forbid we produce a user friendly application. Um, and now it's basically happening. You see, five out of five, five out of five, yay! Everybody's, everybody's happy. So yeah, these unit tests are super picky, even in industry. Um, if you're off by one character in the output with these automated unit tests, uh, it's going to be flagged. It's going to fail. Um, but the good news is, at least the computer's testing your code, and you don't have a manual QA person doing it. Um, because that, that creates all sorts of scalability issues. If you need people to test the code, uh, oh my gosh, uh, that's a whole QA nightmare. So at the end of the day, it's a love-hate relationship with these automated tests. And I get emails all the time from students, oh, the stupid test, I've got the right output, but it's freaking out. Well, it's not the exact output that it's looking for at the end of the day, okay? So just just always keep that in mind when you're when you're dealing with, even in industry. Uh, the automated unit tests are going to look for a very, very specific uh, output. All right, so that's lab 214. Let's talk about lab 215. And notice all of this has to do with math and, and, these, and these formulas. Again, you don't have to come up with these formulas off the top of your head. But in industry, would you have to take one of these formulas and implement them in code? Yes. Um, so... And at the end of the day, I'm just trying to show you a solution. Make sure that you can read through the solution, step through it. Everything makes sense. Get the tests to be happy. That's all really good experience for industry on the OA. Uh, it's just if you're presented some code, can you kind of work through it in your head and know what the answer is? I don't think they're going to give you anything this complex with these these complex formulas. But again, it's still really good experience so for 215 expression for calories burn during workout that's what i should do that's what i've been missing i need to start working out again uh following equation estimates average calories burned for a person when exercising well it doesn't really specify which exercise but whatever uh calories equals your age times blah your weight times blah your heart rate times blah i mean look at this super picky values Let's just go with it and say, okay, we believe that this is a true formula. Write a program that, that uh, using inputs, aha, look how many inputs we have, age, weight, heart rate, and time. We have four inputs. Output the average calories burned. Once you plug in those one, two, three, four inputs, output whatever that formula says is your calories burn and notice they do give us a good example here well if the input is these four values well then the output should look exactly like this and that's why they call this out down here right they're basically telling you once you have that you, you've evaluated this formula in your program make sure that you print it out exactly like this otherwise the automated test is going to complain and you're not going to pass any of these automated tests. So at least here, they're being a little more specific, all right? All right, so how do we go about doing this? 
Well, one potential solution, not the only solution, but again, at the end of the day, as long as this is the input and, and you get this as your output, you have a potential solution. Now, the question is, what well, is this, right? On the OA, they give you this code here. Does this code meet these requirements? You should be comfortable looking at this code and verifying that, yep, that, that should do exactly what uh, the, the, the question or the requirements is asking me to do. And we do see that, sure enough, we have our input code, which allows the user to type in these four values. We have the process part of the code that calculates the calories. We have uh, our output part of the code that lets us know what the final value is with all of these input values. All right, so if we look at it real quick, one line at a time, and then we'll step through it. Uh, does this make sense? Line three, ask for the input from the user, cast it to an int, and then once it's an int or an integer, it takes that and assigns it to age years. Yeah, we're gonna assume that this first value is the age years, and it is an integer, it is not a float. So that seems reasonable. Line four, get input from the user, cast it to an integer, assign it to this guy, a uh, variable called weight pounds. Sure enough, 155, it is an integer. That does seem like a, a valid weight. It's definitely not my weight, I wish it was, but so we'll go about that. Uh, and uh, so line four looks reasonable. Line five, the next input, heartbeats per minute, right? Take the input from the user, cast it to an integer, 148, uh, probably on the treadmill, I guess. That's uh, pretty high. A reasonable heart rate uh, and then line six right notice I'm going line by line because that's what that's what the computer does uh, takes the next input value cast it to an integer that is the minutes sure enough I don't see a decimal point on any of these all of these should be an integer all of these are stored in a variable called whatever you want as long as they are good descriptive variable names fine then line nine says all right we'll take all these four values that that the user just put in, plug them in to the formula, which they gave us here, age times blah, weight times blah, heart times blah, minus 75 point, this is some magic number, I don't even know where they're getting that, but fine, minus that times the time in minutes, divided by 8.368. Sure enough, that looks like a valid formula, that the requirements gave us. So I'm gonna say that looks good. And then line 12 says, well fine, once you've calculated your nice, wonderful calories up here on line nine, let's go ahead and print it out to the screen using two decimal places, all right? And if we do so, we should see some output that looks something like this. All right, so looks good. Uh, let's go ahead and test it. I'm going to go ahead and put a breakpoint here on line nine. And notice I could put it up higher, but at the end of the day, uh, it's not really doing anything except inputting values. So I'm going to trust that this should work. And, and after I input four values, we should hit this line nine. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and debug. Down here in the window, it's waiting for the first value, which is age. I'm going to type in 49. Waiting for the next value, which is the next one, which is the what is it? Uh, weight in pounds, 155. Next one is beats per minute. And notice I'm just using the good input values presented here because in theory, if we use these four values, we should see this. So that gives us a good test condition for a good, for a good gut check here. Can we use different values? Yes, and the automated test will do that later on as well. Uh, and then we hit line six. It's asking us for the time in minutes. We're going to say 60 minutes or an hour. All right, boom. Notice how as soon as I hit that fourth, right? As soon as I typed in that fourth input value, it stopped on line nine. Why? Because that's where I put my breakpoint. Um, and it's going to, if you hover over each one of these variables, you're going to see, sure enough, age in years is 49, weight in pounds is 155, our beat PM is 148 time in minutes is 60 and you can also see all of that uh, down here in the in the variables window all right um, all right so all the variables look to be set to the proper values 
when I hit step over here, I'm going to assume that all of this should calculate to this, 736.21, and it's going to take that and assign it to this variable here called calories, right? So when I hit step over, I would expect calories to be updated to a number very close to this, 736.21. Let's see if that happens. Drum roll, please. Hit step over. Calories is 736.20 blah, blah, blah. Well, notice that there's a six here. So if we do two decimal points, that is going to round this to 736.21, which is why, in theory, we, we see that here. And so calories looks reasonable. That looks like a, a reasonable value. I could punch all this into a calculator. I get the same thing. That all looks good. So then we hit line 12. We'll go ahead and print out whatever's inside of calories with two decimal places and then put the word calories behind it, right? So when it's step over here in the console window, because we're doing print, I should see calories, 736.21, calories. Isn't that redundant? Calories, calories, whatever. So I'm going to step over here, and I would expect to see this here in a console window. Hit step over, and we do see that in the console window. And so in theory, everything checks out. At this point, I'm going to take the code, copy it here into Zybooks, and say submit, submit for grading. Let's see what it says. Yay! So for the first sets of input, everything looks good. But notice it does use, it runs it again with four new unique values. And even with these four new unique values punched into that formula, it still comes up with uh, the proper uh, calories. All right. So again, this is another potential solution. Is this the only solution? No. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know how. I guess you could uh, you could break out these different parts uh, to this formula uh, and store each one of these parts in a unique variable. I'm just trying to think. You know. Is there another way to do this? Yeah, you can break out some of the stuff that that's in the middle of this formula in the, in the different variables and use use those. So even this isn't the only solution. There's still another solution that could be done. All right. All right. So that is lab 215. Let's take a look at lab 216 here. All right. So 216 here. Yay, math functions. So, um, again, more maths involved here. Uh, given three floating point numbers, X, Y, and Z, right? So, obviously, we got to input these, these three numbers, X, Y, and Z. Output X to the power of Z, X to the power of Y, the absolute value of X minus Y, and the square root of X to the power of Z. And if our input is the following, these three values, here's x, y, z, well then the first one, x to the power of z, x to the power of z should be this number. The next one, uh, x to the power of y to the power of z, all right, this, 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 this should be this number. And then the next one, the absolute value of x, right? So if the idea is that the process part, we're supposed to calculate four output values instead of just one using three input values. All right, here is one, and they're very specific as to how we should print our output. Basically everything on one line separated by a space, only two decimal points for each output value. Fair enough, what is one potential solution? Here is one potential solution. And again, aha, notice line one. This is new. Uh, we are importing the math library. Question is why? Why in the heck will we need to input the math library? Well, uh, the requirements tell us we need to use this power of function. And this power of function is only available in the math library. All right, so that is why we imported math so that, well, not only POW or power of, also 
uh, absolute value of because yeah here the absolute value of so this math library has lots of even square root has lots of good functions uh, that we need so for sure that's why line one exists uh, lines three to five is the input and it's kind of funny because here this is the process and the output right and sometimes you'll see this even in industry where they make one line of code that, that's doing lots of things the only problem with this is if you go to debug this and you get some weird output you're not going to know which part of this line caused the weird output so another way to do this might be This is probably more, stop it. This is probably more debuggable. Just so I know what in the heck is going on here. Because we can't really step through each one of these and evaluate each one of these on their own like this because it's all sitting in the middle of a print operation so i'm going to break out each little part here especially in industry when you get to some really complex <laughs> mathematical algorithms you need to know well, which part of that equation isn't working right and then we can just replace all of this Uh, maybe I should have called it value, not value too, but I'm not very original, I guess. What does output for? Okay. So at least here we can step through each one of these and see if you know, each one of these makes sense. Uh, let's go ahead and set the breakpoint. Let's run the debugger. All right, let's put in these three values. 5.0 is X, 1.5 is Y, 3.2 is Z. Why did I do that? Because that's what they provided over here for us. And notice we do hit the, the breakpoint on line nine. So when I step over this, line nine, I would expect to see output one is equal to this, 172.47. So let's see, step over. Sure enough, output one, 172.47. I step over line 10 and we should see 361.66 sure enough looks good step over line 11 we should see output 3 is equal to 3.50 sure enough step over line 12 we should see output 4 is equal to 13.13 .13. looks good and then line 13 should print to the console when I step over here. We should see this in the in the console window. And sure enough, there it is to two decimal points, places, right? Each one of these has two decimal places. Why? Because we're using the format specifier with 0.2f for each one of these variables. All right. So this looks good to me. Let's find out, shall we? Bada boom, bada bing. Let's go into submit mode, submit for grading. Let's see what we got. Yay, five out of five, five out of five. Here's the initial values that we test. It looks good. Here's three unique values that we didn't test, but even the automated test says, yep, that looks good. That, that is what I would expect for those three values. Okay, so lab 216 is completed. Let's go to 217. Oh my gosh. This is, you know what? Um, all right. The, the only really good reason for this is that you may see some requirement. I don't know about on the OA, but in industry, you may see a formula where 
you have to take a particular variable to the power of another variable. And you have to know what that, what that means. All right. Um, if the input is 440, so, so basically our program is supposed to take one input value called the frequency, called F0. And as long as you have F0, well, then you can calculate the next one. This is so, this is way down into the weeds. Um, my gosh, look at this. Is it possible? Yes. Uh, let me show you one possible solution, but please don't freak out if this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, all right, let's look at the code and let's make sure that this kind of lines up with what we're seeing here. For sure, we're taking a single input value called starting frequency. That makes sense, at least in my head, because that's what the requirements tell us. You get one input value, and it does say it's called a starting. What does it call it a starting frequency anywhere in here? Can I... All right, so we take this input value, uh, and then we have this R value. Where the heck is R? Here. R is equal to 2 to the power of 1 12th. 2 to the power of 1 12th is equal to R. All right. And then to get these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 values, 1, 2, wait, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 values, well, the first is the starting frequency, which is 440. It's the same. Fine, makes sense. The next is a starting frequency to the power of R. <laughs> I don't even know if I could. <laughs> All right. So this is one potential solution. Uh, just know that if you take this solution, this one solution, plug it in, hit submit mode, hit submit for grading. As long as your output is exactly what is expected, you're good. I guess where, where I'm note to publisher, I would have to probably reread this a hundred times before I would even realize that I'm supposed to take R to the power of one, R to the power of two, R to the power of three. Uh, I guess that's okay, fine, that's here. <laughs> so at the end of the day, this is more of a math class than a programming problem. Uh, it's up to you if you really want to dive in on that one. Um, yeah, let's go to let's let's go to lab two point eighteen. Oh my gosh, some of this and please don't get scared off by this math. Okay, there's plenty of there's plenty of applications out there that that, that don't go all the way down into the weeds on uh, on this math stuff. I mean, look at Facebook, look at Instagram, right? Look at social media. I, now, for sure, when you get into embedded systems and mission critical systems that are flying planes and rockets, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, you need to be concerned about the formulas and the precision and how to put it all together. I just it seems a bit odd to be introducing super complex mathematical examples like this this early, but we won't talk about that. All right, so let's go to two eighteen. I need the aerospace engine in there. Ah, uh, convert to dollars. Finally, something at least relatable. <laughs> um, we got four values representing quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. All right, and basically, it sounds like we're supposed to put in the number of quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies, and, and guess what? It will show us how many dollars and how many cents do we have. And at the end of the day, we want to. This one, this is our output, right? Amount of all of all the quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies you put in is equal to this many dollars with two decimal places, which is how we do cents, right? Um, all right. So if our input is four, well, that means we have four quarters. Three, well, that means we have three dimes. Two, well, that means we have two nickels. One, that means we have one penny. All right. Well, four quarters is a dollar. Right, 
Three dimes is 30 cents. Two nickels is 10 cents. So that's 40 cents. One penny is one cent. So is that 41 cents? Yeah. So if we put in 4321, that's equal to a dollar and 41 cents. Assuming this is quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. How do we create a solution that does this? All right. Here is one potential solution. Notice how much <laughs> friendlier this is. Bam, whatever that frequency thing is in 217. All right. So first part is the input, part of the input paradigm. Sure enough, we have the user entering four values, quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. We have the process part where we are calculating the dollars based off of those quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. We have the output part, which is finally displaying, whoops, output part, which is finally displaying how much dollars, how much money you have if you have those coins. All right. Um, yeah, it looks reasonable to me. Four input statements for these four values. Uh, process, yeah, quarters is worth 25 cents, dimes is worth 10 cents, nickels is worth 5 cents, pennies is worth 1 cent, which is why you, you could put times 1 here, I guess, but I don't know. anything times 1 is itself, so I think that's why they don't have it. And then after you know how many cents you have, well, remember we're printing out dollars, right, and 100 cents is in a dollar, so we do need to divide it by 100. All right, so this formula here looks good to me, seems to meet the requirements. We print out, finally, the, the number of dollars here at the end. All right, so let's step through it. Let's make sure that this does what we think it's going to do. So we are going to run the debugger here in PyCharm. I'm going to type in this input, 4321, four quarters. Three dimes, two nickels, one penny, niner. And it does, sure enough, hit line eight, because that's where we set our break point. And quarters is four, dimes is three, nickels is two, pennies is one. And we could bust out our calculator and, and do this, right? Plug in all those values. And we should end up with, yeah, 1.41 if we do all this math right. So when I hit step over on line eight here, I would expect to see dollars updated to 1.41. Sure enough, dollars is 1.41, dollars is 1.41. And then line 11 says, we'll go ahead and print that, that dollars amount out to the screen with two decimal places. Well, there's only two decimal places anyways. So yeah, we're gonna, we should see amount 141 here in the console window. So I'm going to step over. Sure enough, amount 141 is in the console window. This looks like a good solution. So I'm going to copy, paste it here. Yeah, submit mode, submit grading. And bada boom, bada bing. Yay, full credit. Notice it does try some different input combinations here. And for sure, that's important in industry. Just because your code works well for one set of input values does not mean it works well for all sets of input values, hence the QA team. Uh, and they're going to constantly be trying to break your software. And hopefully, you're trying to break your own software before it gets to the QA team. Okay, Just because it runs well for one set of input values does not mean it runs well for all sets. And that's why you see these automated tests trying a bunch of different input values. Whew. Okay, so that being said, uh, I did what I wanted to do today, which is uh, get us through uh, all these different labs using PyCharm, kind of stepping through it, looking at it. What you're going to see is when we get to the more complex uh, uh, data, uh, code algorithmic structures like conditional statements like loops uh for sure you're going to need this debugger trust me on this all right you might be able to to do this guessing game without a debugger 
here and keep trying different things until it works but uh, you know things only get more complex so please take the time now to use a Python IDE like PyCharm uh, Community Edition which is free and get comfortable with setting that breakpoint stepping through the code um, because that that insight under the hood is going to save you hours or even days or even weeks worth of work trust me <laughs> okay right now it seems kind of silly but later on as long as you're comfortable with that debugger uh, it's going to pay off in huge dividends all right and industry will expect that you can use uh, a debugger and um, I wish they they would have like a little mini debugger uh, inside these labs like to do with C173 but that's just not currently the case note to publish all right so with that said, have a great rest of your week. Uh, definitely, if you have any questions, reach out to uh, your course instructor, and we can do a screen share and walk through it together. But, uh, but yeah, that's that. So if you have any questions, definitely let us know. But otherwise, uh, uh, have, a, have a great one.